All right, well, welcome to our first class. Um, and I'm tentatively calling our series No Final Conflict. This is a long title, but I just can't think, I can't think of a better um, title at this point. So if anybody thinks of a better title, but I'm calling it No Final Conflict, and that's taken from Francis Schaeffer's idea that um, if we believe that all truth is God's truth, so that whatever is true in science that we discover in under the topic of science and whatever is true or a true interpretation of that science and a true interpretation of the Bible, that if you reconcile those things and, and you have to try to reconcile those things, there's going to be no conflict between them. Um, because our, our culture tries to pit science against the Bible or the Bible against science. Even some Christians do that. They, they try to pit sci uh, the Bible against science. But that's not really the issue at all. It's, it's what's true about science and what's true about the Bible. And if it's truth from God, it's n there's going to be no conflict between those two things. So, so what I'm going to do in this series is we're going to tackle different things that the Bible addresses that is also addressed in science or vice versa. And that's what our focus is going to be on. But because most people today are exposed to and primarily taught evolution, the average student in America has at least 200 pages of teaching in evolution while they go through school, which is probably more than that, but it's at least 200 pages that, they, that what they've been taught is naturalistic, materialistic evolution, macroevolution. Uh, molecule, to, the, the theory of molecule to man um, is promoted in our culture. And unless you're in a church or in a Christian school, you are going to have absolutely no exposure to intelligent design or to creationism uh, that God specially created. Uh, mankind and all that exists. So, um, so that's uh, so. I'm going to entitle this series "No Final Conflict," and everything hopefully will fall in line between how does what does the Bible say and what does science say, and how do we align those things. So today, what I want to do is you have a you have a 16-page bibliography that I put together, and we're just going to sort of walk through this, and this is really going to be an introduction and an overview of what we're going to cover, and um, so I'm gonna I'm just going to walk through this, and then we'll have some time for some questions, and uh, that'll sort of be the format that we're going to go through. I'll have an outline for you every week, and if you're watching on video on our YouTube channel, um, you can print out these notes. I'll have it in a PDF form for you and you can print these out. So if you're away as well or you can't make it, um, you can keep up with the series as well. And uh, one of the reasons I'm doing this is because I'm going to, I have uh, today and the next two weeks finishing up the book of Revelation. And then I'm going to begin um, an expositional teaching on the book of Genesis. But I don't want the teaching on Genesis or the sermons on Genesis to be too academic because uh, that's not everybody's cup of tea. But this class is going to be primarily academic. So it's going to be like being in a college course um, or a graduate course in some cases on the different issues we're going to cover. And I hope to just sort of cover, you know, until once we run out of questions and once we run out of topics, we'll move on to something else. So I don't know how long. We're just totally flexible. We're going to do what we can to, you know, answer hopefully all the questions you have. And once you guys run out of questions and you see there's no conflict between science and the Bible and we know everything there is to know about science and the Bible, we'll be done. So, uh, but at some point we're going to have to pull a plug because in reality that's just never going to stop, okay? Because there's just always going to be more questions and more research. Okay, so, uh, so you have 16 pages, and what I've entitled this is Resources on Science, Creation, Evolution, Genesis, and the Bible. And I have sent these out to some people um, as a PDF. So if you want it on your computer, you know, if you want to have this on your computer so that you can keep it on your computer and your phone and that type of thing, just let me know, 
and I'll make sure I send that to you. Send me an email and then I'll send you an email so you can have this as an attachment. But this is loose leaf. Um, and uh, so we're going to go through this. So what I'm going to do is I've, I've put this alphabetically and um, there are topics uh, we, we may cover a lot on each of these topics or a little. It just sort of depends on your interest and and sort of even my own interest as we're working through Genesis. Um, but but this is alphabetical, so it's not in order of priority or anything. It's just alphabetical. But the first one of the first topics we're going to talk about is Adam and Eve. And believe it or not, there's a big debate among Christians, not just uh, non-believers, but among Christians on whether or not um, there is a there was a literal Adam and Eve that were specially created by God. And there are Christians like uh, Francis Collins and uh, what's his name? Lemero. Can't think of his first name. Uh, Dennis Lemero. And pretty much all the people that are part of BioLogos, which is um, what they like to call, um, what do they call it? They call it either, we call it typically theistic evolution. They like to call themselves um, evolutionary creationism. And again, we'll talk more about that and why they want to be called that or identified as, as that. Um, but there are Christians who believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. They believe Jesus rose again. But they don't believe that Adam and Eve were literally specially created by God. They believe that they evolved just like evolution teaches uh, 200,000 years ago. And uh, they have different views of that. And, and again, so what I'm going to be doing in this series is, is I'm going to be sharing a, a lot of views I don't believe but I want you to at least understand that there are people who profess Christ, who profess faith in Christ, that have a wide variety of beliefs on all the topics we're going to be looking at. And I'm going to try and expose you to all of these so you can intelligently check these things out for yourself. You can go to these different sources. There's enough videos that you can spend the rest of your life just watching videos on these topics without even reading any of this stuff. Um, but I, again, you know, Shirley asked at the beginning, before the class started, have you read all these books? And <laughs> I haven't, okay, yet. I plan on reading most of these books. And some of these books are pretty big books, and some of them are pretty technical. And because science is not my forte, I'll probably be using them more like you do when you're doing a research paper. You're not necessarily reading the whole book, but you're reading the particular section or area that pertains to your study. Uh, but as I'm going through Genesis, there's not going to be an organizational, topical, meth methodological, logical, analytical reason of why I pick topics. I'm just going to randomly really pick topics. And usually I'm going to pick topics that relate most to what I'm preaching on that week, that relate to science and the Bible. So, uh, and sometimes we'll be stuck because when we talk about the days and whether the days were literally 24 hour periods, six days, like let's say Monday through Saturday and then Sunday or Saturday is the, in the Old Testament, of course, that would have been the Sabbath. So you start creation would be Sunday. And then the day of rest would be Saturday. Are those literal 24-hour periods of time? Um, and there are 12 widely held views on what that means by Christians. Okay, not just anybody, but by Christians. 12 different views. So we're going to look at all those views. So that means that even though we may move in Genesis past that, we're still going to be stuck in dealing with some of the things that we've already covered in Genesis and we're going to keep moving forward. Because there is a time, Genesis 1 through 11 is the pri is the, are the primary chapters that deal with science because they deal with the flood, so that deals with geology and, um, you know, Noah's Ark and, and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to deal with geology, we're going to deal with the flood, we're going to deal with astronomy. Uh, and the stars and things like that. So, but, but again, we're going to tackle Adam and Eve. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to point out to you as I'm going through today, I'm just going to point out to you maybe one book, one or two books that I would recommend. And again, my perspective 
I, I'm going to be totally honest about this. I lean towards a young earth. And I lean towards taking Genesis. When you just read Genesis in its simplest form, uh, that's the way I read it. And that's the way I defend it. And that's the way I'm going to teach it. However, I have to be honest and I have to say I am not an expert in science. So I'm interested to know from the different scientists and the different Christians that are scientists why they, why they view it as millions of years, why they view it as long periods of time. What is their reasoning for that? And my hope is that, if, and if anybody is watching, I, you know, it's interesting the people that watch our video because it's on YouTube. Sometimes people will type something in and they end up watching us. You know, they just want, they'll type in evolution or they'll type in atheism. And, if, and sometimes if I've addressed it and it's, and it's recent, they'll be watching us somewhere in, around the world. I know we have somebody in England that watches our Sunday service every week because they don't have a good evangelical church uh, within a half an hour radius from them. So they watch us every week and they've been doing so since COVID. So we just don't know who's watching. Um, and my hope is that uh, as people watch, It'll help them to wrestle with this whole idea of what's true, uh, what's objectively true related to science and the Bible. How do we reconcile those things? And again, I think if we do that properly, if we're interpreting the scripture properly and we're interpreting science properly, there's going to be no final conflict. But that doesn't mean that we don't, it's not, it's not going to be easy sometimes. Sometimes we're going to read one person's view, or you're going to hear somebody's view, and go, that sounds really good, until you hear the view next week by somebody else, and go, I think that sounds better than that view. And then when you compare and contrast them, you're like, okay, when I take all the information, it seems like this view is the best all the way around. And for me, at this point, and again, I haven't read all these books, I am a novice when it comes to science, so I'm learning, I'm in the process of learning. Um, but, uh, but again, I think that because all truth is God's truth, truth matters. And when it comes to things like salvation and things that are as important as Genesis, because Genesis is the foundation of everything. Genesis is the foundation for what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be human, what it means to be made in the image of God, um, what sin is, why sin is a problem what God has done to redeem us from sin, and, and on and on. I mean, every foundational thing that relates to belief and practice in life starts in Genesis. So Genesis really is, it's, it's sort of a no-brainer after finishing Revelation, where do you go next? It's, okay, we've covered what the end says and what's coming, but now we're going back to the beginnings. And that's what Genesis mean. It's, it means beginning. And um, so, uh, Brian, there's an outline up there yeah. for you that you'll need. Yes. Yeah. Please reprint more. It's, it ran out. Oh, we ran out. Okay. Oh. Okay. No, that's well, not the one. That's, that's not complete. Okay. I'll, I'll get one. Again, if you need an outline, we'll have more next week. We'll, we'll print more. Uh, but just try and follow. So, Brian, you might want to look on with somebody um, yeah. just so you're not lost. Maybe sit over with um, Dan. Sorry, that that's okay. No problem. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, okay, so, so again, I want to just go through this, and again, I'm going to be doing a lot of repetition, a lot of, using a lot of terminology, and, and again, you're here, those of you who are here have the advantage of asking questions and getting clarification and so forth. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm just going to dive in. And so on the books on Adam and Eve, the book that I would, re there are two books here that I highly recommend that... I haven't read them in their entirety, but I've read most of them already, and it's the second two books uh, by Thomas Howe, A Critique of William Lane Craig's In Quest of the Historical Adam. And, and sort of, you sort of need, will, you need to read William Lane Craig's Quest for the Historical Adam first, but William Lane Craig is a very well-known apologist. I disagree with William Lane Craig on a lot of things, okay? He's not related to me for one thing, thank God. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I wouldn't mind if he was related to me. Then I'd get his books for free and I wouldn't have to pay so much for him. But, um, but William Lane Craig is a sharp guy. I'm glad he's on our team and he's on our side. But there are several areas where I very much disagree with William Lane Craig uh, on theology, uh, apologetics, and other things. However, 
I don't doubt that William Lane Craig is a Christian. I don't doubt that he's, we're going to see him in heaven. Um, but his book, um, uh, William, uh, A Quest for the Historical Adam, he takes a theistic evolution view. And I, th I think that's a big problem. And I'll talk about why that's a problem when we get to that subject, when we get to that topic. But Thomas Howe is a, um, is a apologist who has so taken issue with it, he decided to write a rebuttal to the book. And so if, if you want to get, again, we're all, we can only go so deep in half an hour lectures weekly here. There's so much more. And we're going to be scratching the surface for most things. But at least it'll give you places to go, videos to watch, books to read. So if there's any particular area of interest that you have, you can go there. Um, but I, I would recommend, um, if you just want a good defense of what I'm going to be teaching through the book of Genesis, Terry Mortensen's book, uh, that fourth book there, Searching for Adam, Genesis and Truth About Man's Origin, takes the young earth perspective and that Adam and Eve were created specially. And he deals with all the arguments from the other views, okay, and from evolution as well. And so that's the book I would recommend. So most of the books I'm going to be recommending are my view, but I'm also going to tell you there are books that have other views. And, and again, by the way, the first book I mentioned is edited by Ardell B. Canaday, and it's four views on the historical Adam. And if you, go, if you read that book and you go to Amazon, you'll see I did the first review on that book. I actually read it the day it came out. I can't remember when it came out, but I read it, and I did the first review on Amazon.com. Um, but uh, so in that view, you have the four main representatives of Christians. So what you have is, and again, we're going to talk a lot about this stuff. So if you don't remember this right away, don't worry about it. But we're going to be looking at four primary views. We're going to be looking at theistic evolution. Um, and there are Christians that hold to this view, and, that, and they basically buy into everything that modern science teaches about evolution. Again, if you take five theistic evolutionists and you have them in one room, they're not going to agree on everything. They're actually going to disagree on a lot of things. But what they're going to believe is they're going to believe that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. They're going to believe that mankind's 200,000 years old. And they're going to believe that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. And they're all going to agree on that. But their starting point is God. And then they're just going to say that God uses evolution in the process of his creating mankind. Uh, so evolu evolution. So in the, in the Adam and in, in the historical, in the four views on historical Adam, um, one of the representatives of this position, which the website for them, all these guys have websites and organizations. And this was started by Francis Collins. Biologos. They have a whole website and organization that uh, Christians and, and even Catholics and Jews and Muslims are a part of this. Because again, there are uh, anybody who's monotheistic, uh, you know, Jews, Catholics, um, Christians, so forth, they all have representatives in this camp. And the majority of Catholic theologians are theistic evolutionists. Um, and so that's just an interesting fact. Okay, so there's a representative of this position, and they'll write their position on why they believe Adam and Eve evolved. And I think it's Lemero who actually defends this position. And, uh, and then the other three respond to what he's written. And then they each write an essay defending their position, and the other three respond. Okay, so then another... Uh, uh, another organization is, um, is, the, is the Intelligent Design Movement. And a lot of you guys are familiar with Stephen Meyer and Michael Dembski and Michael Behe. Um, uh, so there's all these people that are part of the Intelligent Design Movement. And what they're trying to do is they're not trying to integrate the Bible and science. They're just trying to say that in their study of science, without the Bible in the picture, they're not convinced evolution is true. And their big emphasis is how design shows intelligence. 
And so there are actually non-believers that are a part of this uh, that are defending intelligent design. People like David Berlinski, who's a uh, mathematician, and you have other, you know, uh, a lot of them are Christians, but there are people that are Jewish and uh, other faiths. And even Michael, Den uh, Michael Denton, who wrote, I think, the best attack on evolution, is an agnostic. But he's a part of the intelligent design movement. And so this would be the organization, <laughs> skipping my mind right now, does anybody, can anybody think? It's called, they have the Discovery Institute in Seattle. Um, but there's a name for the organization, I can't think of it. But we'll talk about it so much, you'll get it at some point. So there's an intelligent design person also in the argument on Adam and Eve. Then you have uh, the old earth people and um, this would be, uh, what are they called? Well, we'll just call them Old Earth. They have a more specific. The most famous of these is Hugh Ross. And uh, the organization that defends this position best is Reason to Believe. They're based in Pasadena. And so Hugh Ross, who's an astronomer, is the most famous person that defends the old Earth position. And then that's represented in that book as well. And then you have Young Earth, y I'll just call it YEC, Young Earth Creationism. And again, um, Answers in Genesis today would be the biggest defender of this. And Ken Ham is the founder of that, who came from the Institute of Creation Research in San Diego, which still exists, but they moved to Dallas, Texas. And uh, Henry Morris uh, was the guy that really got this idea off the map of young earth creationism. Young earth creation, old earth believes the same thing as theistic evolution in terms of the age of the earth. And therefore they have to do some gymnastics in their interpretation of Genesis 1 through 11. Uh, so do intelligent, uh, all, all three of these, what they have in common is they all believe that modern science, what modern science teaches as far as age, and then the evolutionary ramifications of that factor into that. Whereas young earth creationists, that's my position, believes that God did not use evolution. And that the earth and people and so forth have, uh, have been around for 10,000 years or less. Okay? And again, I'm not going to prove that today. I'm just saying that's what I believe. But we're going to be teaching you the pros and cons of all these positions. And, uh, and how that works with the Bible and how that works with modern science and ancient science and, and everything in between. Okay, now I got to rip through <laughs> the rest of this. But again, I just want you to see where we're going. And again, I'm going to recommend a few books. Okay, Artificial Intelligence or Transhumanism is a huge issue today. As a matter of fact, we have someone in our church that's getting their PhD in Artificial Intelligence uh, at Berkeley. And um, so this is a, this is a, a, a very new, expanding field. Um, but really, all four of those books are good. Um, the newest of those books is by Robert Marx. It just came out a week ago. And I've read about half of it already. It's really good. But it shows how artificial intelligence can never replace uh, humanity made in the image of God. It's very fascinating. Um, Jeffrey Simons, or Simmons actually is his name. Uh, he, I've got two books recommended here by him. He's a medical doctor and just fascinating, a, a fascinating writer because he writes from a medical standpoint of how there are things, how there are systems that are God given that can't be explained through evolution. And it's just really a fascinating book. And he shows how uh, it's ironic that. In artificial intelligence, it takes intelligent people to build robots or anything that is artificially intelligent, and yet these same people are evolutionists. In other words, they're buying into a system that's just evolved, but everything they do is by design. And just the irony of that. And he brings that out in many different ways in the book, and it's really interesting. Okay, then you have astronomy. 
And um, again, a lot of different people here. Um, Jason Lyle, those last two books, he is an astronomer. He's, he has a PhD in astronomy, and he's sort of the main guy at Answers in Genesis. So he has a young Earth pers uh, perspective. And this is one of the most challenging things for young Earth people because the distance of the stars and the galaxies and the millions of years and all that kind of stuff, it's like, well, how can you do that with 10,000 years? So we'll tackle that. We're not going to tackle it today. I'm not going to answer that question today, but we will deal with that. I'm going to deal with how the different positions deal with that. Uh, but I would recommend Lyle from my perspective. And also Danny Faulkner is also uh, the expanse of heaven where creation and astronomy enter. He is also a young earth guy. And Russell D. Humphrey's Starlight and Time, Solving the Puzzle of Distant Starlight in a Young Universe. He is also a young earth guy. The other guys are old earthers. And uh, so you can sort of hear, get there. Actually, uh, Donald DeYoung and John Whitcomb are also young Earth guys as well. Uh, but again, uh, I'll talk more about these and especially go into more detail on what these guys teach when we tackle the specific topics. Okay, these other books are really interesting because that next section, believers, are they're either Christians or theists who are all scientists. And all of these books uh, have, uh, most of them have chapters uh, chapter after chapter of different scientists that are either theists or Christians throughout history. And again, it's only since the advent of Darwin's origin of the species that before that, all scientists, uh, virtually all scientists, over 90% of scientists all believed there was a God. And they did science to glorify God. And that changed with the advent of the origin of the species, which we'll talk about that. Um, more specifically at some point. Um, a lot of good books here. Um, I, I'd say one of the more interesting ones that I've already read is Anthony Flew because Anthony Flew uh, was, he was considered the most notorious atheist of the 20th century. Um, and he became a theist before he died. We don't know if he became a Christian or not, but he did become a theist. And it was actually through his study of science, he was convinced that we have come about through intelligent design. Not by chance, not by accident, but we were designed by some kind of God. And so he actually, he debated people through years. There are a lot of people you've heard of who debated him as Christians. And then he, this is rare, that somebody who later in their life, he was, I think, in his 80s, when he renounced his uh, atheism and said, I believe there's a God, there's a personal God. And so that book is fascinating because it sort of walks through his journey of how he came to believe through the study of science that there is a God. So just a really interesting book. And again, fascinating because it would be like Richard Dawkins becoming a theist. Um, he, he actually was much smarter than Richard Dawkins. Uh, Richard, the new atheists use a lot of weak, they're very weak in their philosophy and in their argumentation. It's more ad hominem than anything else. And they're, they're, you know, they sell a lot because they're funny and they attack people ad hominem, but they don't have great arguments. They, if you want to read real atheists who can think, you read people like Anthony Flew. Um, so anyway, interesting book. Okay, chemistry. We're going to get into chemistry on page, or, or sorry, I skipped page two. Uh, we're going to get into biology and um, a bunch of good books there. Again, I think that um, I like reading Michael Denton just because he's, he is an agnostic. So I think he doesn't have any stake in the game. Uh, he's got a lot to lose because how does a guy make a living if nobody will hire him if he's attacking evolution? So he has a lot of integrity um, as a biologist attacking the biological evidence for evolution. And his books, all his books, he's written 10 books that all are specifically about different aspects of evolution. And every single one of them annihilates evolution as a theory. All of them. And so he's part of the intelligent design movement, but he is not a Christian and he's not a theist. He's an agnostic. But I, that's why I like reading him, because he, he just has no stake in the game. It's like his, his thing is, what's true? What's objectively true here? And as a scientist, I can't buy this ridiculousness of evolution 
And I was an evolutionist, but it just doesn't hold water. And so that, those are the books that I give to evolutionists. Because if I give them books by creationists, they won't even read them, honestly. They just won't read them. They, they laugh about it, they mock it, whatever. But first of all, you have to get them to see that evolution has a lot of problems. And the best thing to do is give them books by people that were evolutionists, that aren't even Christians yet. They may not even be theists. But they're saying, hey, I believe this stuff, but here's the problem with this. So they don't have any stake in the game. And, and those are the books that I give to people that are evolutionists and aren't believers yet. I, I like to build bridges with them rather than give them like the total opposite of what they believe and say, believe this. And they're going, are you kidding me? You know, that's so far from what I believe. Uh, I'm not even going to read it. And they don't. Now, that's not to say that at some point you don't give them the creationist stuff. You do, but you sort of got to, you know, again, when I, deal with, when I deal with someone who's an atheist, my goal is not for them to be a Christian. It's for them to be a theist, to believe that there's a personal God. Then once they believe there's a personal God, who is this personal God? Then you, go to G then you get to Jesus. Then you get to Christianity. But you, you have to, it, math is that way. You know, you don't start some, but you don't take a four-year-old and go, okay, here's a calculus book. You know, first of all, they can't read. But again, with a four-year-old, you can teach a four-year-old. I mean, four-year-olds usually, you ask them, how old are you? And they go, one, two, three, four. They know that much about math. Now, until they turn five, they're probably going to not know what the next finger is. But they have to go, they have to have a process of learning. And it's the same thing with non-believers. You have to go through a process of learning with them. Okay, so, um, so biology, and then from a, um, from a Christian standpoint, William Dembski's and Jonathan Wells. If you have kids or high schoolers, that's a textbook on biology. And what's interesting about Jonathan Wells is Jonathan Wells was an evolutionist and taught at Berkeley. But he also came to believe that evolution was false. But he was an expert. He taught evolution at Berkeley, okay, at the liberal bastion that is Berkeley. He taught it there. And so his books, he primarily, what he attacks is he attacks what, what he calls the icons of evolution. He's even got a book by that title. And he shows how, how evolution continues to perpetuate the lie of Lucy and all these other things, where they'll build this whole idea out of fragments of bone. And he shows you uh, just how, how the textbooks continue to, pe to pe perpetuate the frauds that have been revealed in evolution time after time again. They still put all those icons in the books and teach it as fact. When it's, at best, a very weak theory filled with fraud. And so he's written four books on that subject. And so his book, along with Michael Dembski, they're both part of the intelligent design movement. What they do is they teach biology in that book. It's, it's designed for high schoolers, high school biology, which is usually ninth or 10th grade. And that's a textbook on that. So if you have kids that are in the public school, you want to con, uh, you know, contrast that. Another book there that I didn't put an asterisk by because I haven't read it yet, but it's considered the best book on biology from Dean Kenyon. Dean Kenyon is from San Francisco State. And he was, a, again, an evolutionist who came to the realization that evolution has a lot of problems. So he and uh, Percival Davis wrote this groundbreaking, groundbreaking book of pandas and people, which was the first biological textbook used propounding an intelligent design position accepted in public schools. Now, it's been canceled now. But when it came out, uh, they were using it in public schools. And so that's sort of a classic. It's out of print, but I, I got a copy of it for about 40 bucks recently. So I'm just starting. That's one of the, again, I'm reading a lot and I'm trying to assimilate this stuff. Bear with me. Be patient, please. Um, there, there's just a lot of good stuff here. Uh, another thing, Kurt Wise. Kurt Wise is part of the underbiology there. You know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take two weeks to go through this because <laughs> there's too much here. Um, so I'll take questions after this, after biology. But Kurt Wise is another guy that I think you should know. He has a, he has a PhD from Harvard 
very sharp guy, very interesting. Um, he's had several times in his career where he can't get a job because he's a creationist. And so um, there is a Christian school, Bryan College, which is named after the famous Scopes trial, that Bryan, uh, Williams Jennings Bryan. Uh, it's Bryan College in Tennessee. It's a Christian school. It's one of the few Christian schools in the nation that still teaches creation science, the young earth position. You know that uh, Biola doesn't teach young earth. Okay? <laughs> Wheaton doesn't teach young earth. Um, the Master's College does. Uh, they're probably the only school in, in California, Christian University, that teaches young earth position. Master's College is it. Okay. Uh, Biola would have theistic evolution faculty, intelligent design, and old earth, and very few young earth. Okay, and that's where I want the school. But I just, I'm just telling you the facts. Okay. Um, but again, you're, you're a hard press. If you're, if you're a young earth guy like Kurt Wise and you're trying to get a university position as a professor, as a scientist, and you're a young earth guy, you cannot get a position today. You're completely canceled. Okay. And again, we'll get into why that is and, and, uh, and you know, but, but Kurt Wise is a very smart guy. You read him and he's so good. So one of the, one of the stuff I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using his, dis his doctoral dissertation has, it's, it's out of print, but he did a layman's version of it. I'm still waiting for it. It's still on order. So I'm still waiting. It's delayed. So I haven't got it yet. Uh, but this is not a book here about biology, but I, but I just want you to be familiar that there's some guys in here that are absolutely brilliant off the charts and they're doing science. But they're having, to do, they're having to raise their own money to do science because research is very expensive and they don't get state grants. They don't get government grants. Uh, you have to be an evolutionist to get any grants, to get any funding, and to get a position on a faculty anywhere in the country, even at Christian universities. That's where we're at. So take COVID and the, mandi the, the vaccine mandates and times it by 100 in the scientific community. As far as just, there's no room to waver from what they say is true. And they hold to this tenaciously. And, uh, and that's, again, why I like reading people like Denton who, who say, hey, I, I'm willing to take the risk of losing my job and I'm just gonna make money by writing books and that's what he's had to do, even though he had a, a tenured position at a university in Australia, he was willing to lose his job for the truth. And did he? Oh, yeah. 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 But, see, that's, that's the thing, though, is these guys, I, you know, a lot of people say, well, there's not a lot of, you know, they don't publish. Yeah, how, how can creationism be true? They don't get published in the scientific journals. That doesn't mean it's not true. Okay. I will. I refuse to get the vaccine. Okay. Fortunately, the church hasn't made me get the vaccine. But if the church, if the board said you got to get the vaccine, I'd say I would protest. I would give my reasons for not getting the vaccine. And if they fire me, they fire me. I'll plant a church somewhere. But there are certain things that I've done the research, and I go. The research shows me that this is better than this. And I think that the ramifications of the vaccine are worse in my studies, and I think, I could, I think the data proves it. But I know, there's, I know some of you have had the vaccine. I mean, I, again, to me, medical issues, are your, they should be your choice. That's right. And I think a one-size-fits-all doesn't work. And I think even uh, to just teach evolution without teaching any of this, that's indoctrination. And that's not an education. That's what the Marxists do. That's what communism does. And that's why we have so many people that are communists and Marxists and socialists in our country, because we indoctrinate, we don't educate. So I'm passionate about that. You can tell I'm passionate about this. <laughs> but again, my, I'm the type of guy, I love people like Kurt Wise. I love people like Michael Denton, even though he's not a Christian. I love people that stand for the truth and they're willing to take the consequences and go against the flow of society because they say, what you're saying is false. I am not convinced. 
and their voice is trying to be silenced and canceled. And I just want you to know that as a Christian, this is going to happen more and more, not just in this area, but other areas. It's already happening tremendously in morality. And the reason it's happening in morality is because the indoctrination of evolution. Everything, the transgender stuff, the homosexual stuff, the same sex stuff, all that stuff is because of evolution. Okay, those were not issues. Even, I mean, even though evolution has gained ground over the last 150 years, it's not until the last 50, 60 years that the sexual revolution has gained ground. But a lot of that was because most people still believe that God specially made Adam and Eve. But if you're not specially evolved, uh, created and you're just evolved, you're from slime, you're going to slime, this is it, then it's just, there, there, yeah, there is no basis for morality. It's just who has the power. You know, who has the power, who has the money? Okay, so um, let me do one more. Let me do the, the Bible and science and just point out a few books here. <coughs> um, I know a lot of you are familiar with Ray Comfort. This is a fun book that's an easy read. It's just a little book. It's, it's about 100 pages. Ray Comfort, Scientific Facts in the Bible, 100 Reasons to Believe the Bible is Supernatural in Origin. And he gives 100 different passages of Scripture that talk about science. And it's just a fun book to read. It's just a little book, a simple book. It's cheap. You can get a paperback version. You can get a Kindle version. But, it, but what he does is he just shows, hey, here are different facts in the Bible about science that are proven today. And it's just a fun read. Um, Michael Guillen on page two, the last book there, he is, he is a, he's an old earth guy, but he has a PhD in astronomy from Cornell. Cornell, if you're going to get a PhD in astronomy from Cornell, that's where Carl Sagan taught. Okay. It is, the, it, is, it, is, it is the Harvard, you know, Harvard for law, or Yale for law, same thing for astronomy. If you go to Cornell, you can get a job anywhere. If you get a PhD from Cornell. Um, well, Michael Guillen got his PhD from Cornell, and he is a Christian. And so he's written a few books. Uh, and again, I don't agree with everything he writes, because again, I don't hold to the old earth position, but uh, he's worth reading. You'll learn a lot. And, and that's the one thing, you know, if you read any of those books, you're going to learn. And there's truth. There's some truth in all of these books, but not necessarily total truth, I don't think. But there's a lot of truth, and you're, you're going to learn from all these books. And my thing with learning is I am not a, I am not a dogmatist or, or say we can only read, don't read anything but the Bible. Okay, I've got 16 pages of books that aren't the Bible. Because, again, I don't have anything to hide. And as Christians, we don't have anything to hide. It's not, it's not like, oh, you, can't, you can only read this. No, um, we're after the truth. And, and if, the, if, if the truth is clear and it and it's holds water and it deals with reality, it's going to...